everyone. I'd like to welcome some, if this is your first time, to a Human System Academy uh, lecture series and to welcome back others who have been here before. My name is Janice Hall and I'm the manager of the, human, the uh, Business and Institutional Management Office in the Human Health and Performance Directorate. And under my office is the Human System Academy. I am the lead and uh, my office assistant here is Deidre Nimmons and we'd like to welcome you all. We're here today to talk about the ISSMP or as she has it up here, she'll do her introduction. Suzanne McCollum will do her introduction. But I want to do some housekeeping first. Okay. So thank you, Janice. Um, as you all know, you're here for uh, the Human Systems Academy. Um, talk on human flight research integration. And uh, what I mean by human flight research integration is specifically research on the space station that utilizes the crew members as, as subjects. So um, just to give you an, an overview of what I'm going to discuss this morning, um, first gonna talk about uh, some about who I am and the team that I manage, um, the ISS Medical Projects. Um, we'll go over how to get started with um, a research study that you want to fly on station. Uh, we'll, I'll attempt to answer the question that everyone asks is why does it take so long to get your research flown? And then we'll talk about some of the unique aspects um, and challenges that we face in designing and flying um, flight experiments. Um, now the talk, I know uh, Janice said we have about an hour and a half. I believe my, this talk I've given before is a little under an hour. So um, I'm willing to take questions as we go through and also have time at the, um, time at the end. So feel free if something isn't clear or you have a question, just raise your hand as we go through. Um, so before I get started with ISSMP, I know I see some familiar faces of folks I know, but do we have any folks that are outside of um, Human Health and Performance Directorate? Okay, excellent. Well, then, um, I'll, so you probably don't know what ISS Medical Projects is, um, so we'll start with that. Um, so ISSMP is, um, this is the project that um, I'm the manager of, and um, you can't have a presentation at NASA without an org chart. So um, <laughs> this is the organizational chart for the Human Research Program. And for those of you not familiar with the Human Research Program, um, this is a program that is managed within the Human Health and Performance Directorate. Um, our program manager is uh, Bill Pulaski. And uh, the program is within SA, but um, uh, Bill Pulaski reports directly to um, Bill Gerstemeyer. And ISSMP down here is uh, one of what they call elements. Um, there's six elements within the human research um, program and ISS Medical Projects is one of those and I'm the manager. Dr. Clarence Sams is our um, element scientist. And we are um, unique from the other five elements within HRP in that we are essentially a service element for the human research program. Uh, we basically manage all aspects of integration and implementation of flight research on station as well as um, um, flight analog platforms. Um, for this talk, I'll specifically be talking uh, about the unique aspect, aspects of station, but um, flight analogs is also a part of our element. So the other research, the other elements are um, research elements within HRP, and so they're responsible for managing uh, research portfolios um, in the various uh, areas that you see, space radiation, human health and countermeasures, exploration medical capability, behavior health and performance, and space human factors and, and habitability. And so these elements um, are responsible for managing the, the, and overseeing uh, the implementation of research that um, addresses the risks and gaps um, that HRP has identified to future human space exploration. And so when one of those studies, there's a lot of ground research that's being done, but when one of those studies requires access to the space station um, or a flight analog um, environment, those studies come to ISSMP to implement and uh, provide all of those services. So that's who we are and what we do. And uh, my talk will specifically discuss um, uh, the, the support that uh, the ISSMP team provides for station, um, uh, for station research as well as the unique process for the human research program. Okay, so again, we, we exist to help HRP 
um, maximize the use of station uh, to address the um, risk, uh, risks to human uh, space exploration. Again, we're uniquely focused on the implementation of the studies. We don't manage the science content. Um, and that makes us different from the other um, research elements. And then we d basically support them in the implementation of their studies. Uh, we also, we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in a few slides, but we also provide overall integration and coordination for other um, users of the crew as subjects on the station. Okay, so we're um, basically uh, charged with assisting the investigator in managing the risks to implementing their study. Um, we uh, provide, we have core capabilities and experts in all of the areas you see here in terms of defining experiment requirements, writing crew procedures, uh, doing crew training, uh, data collection, um, in-flight operations, post-flight data collection, um, data sharing, and uh, uh, downlink and transfer of data to investigators. So um, we're basically, what our real job is to help let the PI focus on the science and let us do all the, uh, the, the project management and interface with um, organizations um, that are basically required to uh, get, your, um, get your study flown. So why, does, why is ISSMP needed? Um, again, I mentioned before that we exist to help maximize the use of the station. Um, station is a very limited resource, um, and we're not quite sure how much longer we're going to have it. Right now, this shows the end of US presence in 2020. Um, I think folks know that NASA has committed to extend at least to 2024, and there's interest in extending to 2028, um, but the partners have not committed past 2020. So it is very important that we integrate and coordinate and utilize the station as best we can uh, with the limited resource that we have. Um, and we can't really wait till, you know, it's not like everybody can come in at the end and go, oh, I gotta fly my, I gotta fly my study, that's, that's not going to work. So. Uh, the sooner we can um, get started and get studies flown, um, the better off we'll be. And that's why we need aggressive strategies um, to close the knowledge gaps that we have and mitigate these um, risks that we have uh, while we have station available to us. Okay, any questions on that with what ISSMP is? When you say yep. Sorry. So yeah. when you say mitigate risk, you mean mitigate the risk of getting the science, not mitigating the risk Yes, uh, I should clarify. So there, yeah, there's different types of mis risk mitigation. The, the research elements are bringing studies forward that are looking to provide answers to questions to help mitigate, mitigate the risks to human space exploration. It's our job to help mitigate the risks to ensure that the study is completed successfully um, on the station. Yes? Was it immediately apparent to me why you needed a research scientist as part of your group if it's mainly integration and coordination, unless perhaps you're actually making decisions about who actually gets to fly and who doesn't? Sometimes we, sure. yes, sometimes we do um, have to make uh, um, priority calls on uh, studies based on operational constraints, which we'll talk some about in a minute. And our um, uh, scientists on our team also help with strategic planning and trying to coordinate and work with the elements to um, uh, manage and uh, better define the, the research content that, that comes to us. So we do, we do need them. <laughs> okay, any other questions on that? Okay, um, so now I'm gonna start, uh, talk about how to get started. Um, and specifically, again, this, this is uh, for studies that are being implemented as HRP studies. So the first thing is, um, so you're an investigator um, and you've written a scientific proposal, as I've said here, and you're just, this is like the best HRP flight study ever. And what you want to know is how do I get from that Word document to seeing your study performed and executed on the station and, and getting you flight data. So I'm going to attempt to explain <laughs> how you get started there. Um, so first, uh, what's required is sponsorship. Um, this is a graphic that um, I borrowed from the Sp Space Station Program Office. This is their graphic, um, which shows the various sponsors, um, uh, groups that, have, uh, that are able to sponsor research on the station. And you can see that, I don't know if you can see this, but HRP is one of these. And it's our job as ISSMP to basically represent HRP to the station program. 
but you'll see there's in this part of the pie here, there's other areas of NASA research. Um, there's biological um, and physical and other life sciences that are done on the station. There's also National Lab. I think most folks have heard of National Lab and they are coming on um, quite uh, strong and aggressively with um, a lot of research where they want to use um, the station. And we also have the international partners, um, the Canadians, Europeans, Italians, and uh, Japanese that have barter agreements with station for because they've provided um, modules or other services to the station. Um, and so they have access to um, flight resources as well. And while for the most part, it's not an absolute, but for the most part, um, any research um, that uses the crew as subjects will come through HRP and ISSMP through implementation. That's not absolute, but for the most part, that's true for NASA research. But the international partners have their own um, objectives and studies that they sponsor that require um, human research, and we play a part in that in integrating those. Yes? Um, we would be involved in the, and I'm going to talk about this some more later in, in a little bit, in the development of the, um, the integration of the complement scenarios. So we would be involved in that way, but unless HRP directs us to, we wouldn't do all of the management and implementation of a study that wasn't sponsored by HRP. Yes? Your graphics seems to indicate that Roscosmos, the Russians are sort of outside the circle. Are you going to elaborate more on uh, studies involving cosmonauts or Russian studies involving American astronauts? That's, that's a very good point. Um, and I should mention, yes, the, you, you see that the, the Russians are, um, are there. I'm, for this particular talk, I'm focusing on the USOS aspect of integration. Um, HRP in particular is doing um, and is working with the Russians a lot, a lot more closely. Um, uh, for example, the one-year mission coming up, we actually are doing some human research with both um, um, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kor Kornienko. We, have, we typically do not do research with um, Russians as subjects because the Russians have their own research program. Um, but there is uh, more collaboration going on right now, but I'm not gonna get into that very much in this, in this talk because that's a whole nother process. <laughs> okay, so in terms of getting started for the HRP process, um, there's a select for flight process um, that exists and it, um, to some it can seem somewhat confusing, but it's actually quite simple. There's um, just a couple boxes you need to check. First is um, you need to have an element sponsor. Um, if you have a proposal of something you want to fly, you know, don't send it to me and say, hey, I want to fly this study on the station. Can you make it happen? It needs to go through one of those other five research elements where they will determine whether or not it's relevant to um, addressing their risks and gaps and it's something they want to sponsor um, to HRP um, to fly. So that's your first step. Uh, next step is uh, merit review. Um, it's very important to HRP that everything, anything we spo sponsor is scientifically sound. So some form of merit review is required. If your proposal goes through a NASA research announcement, um, there will be a formal peer review process. Um, if it's a directed study, um, they might assign a non-advocate review or an element-led review. There's different um, ways that can happen that our science management office will um, determine but um, it does need to be scientifically sound. Um, the next thing is uh, institutional review board approval. Um, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the JSC IRB. Um, this is a board that exists to approve any research, not just flight research. If you're gonna do any research on a, uh, a ground subject here at JSC, um, it needs to go through the IRB and they will address um, uh, whether or not the crew subject would be treated in an ethical, safe, and equitable manner. And then the final thing is a feasibility assessment, and that's where ISSMP comes in. Um, so we look at the proposal and we work with the PI and try to figure out a way to implement it on the station and determine that, yes, we think this is feasible um, and outline what the risks are. So once you have all those, you can go to HRP and get selected for flight and Oops, there we go. 
So once you're selected for flight, then we have the authority to start working with the station program to get you flown on, um, on an increment. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, I've got my study approved, so that does, but that doesn't mean that you can fly on the next increment. And of course, everyone wants to know why not. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to try to talk about next, um, is why does it take so long? So this is, um, uh, this is probably familiar to many of you. This is the, um, the FPIP graphic that shows the ISS um, flight plan. It's a little blurry. Um, but the station is another station program um, graphic that shows all the launches and the cr uh, crew members that are up there, all the, the, the dockings of all the vehicles and whatnot. Um, and I put this up here to show and uh, explain. So the station program uh, plans and uh, implements um, their research in what they call um, increment pairs and in six month uh, kind of chunks of time, if you will. So uh, for example, um, and each increment pair consists of a two month increment and a four month increment. So for example, increment 4344 is the next increment pair coming up. Increment 43 is two months, increment 44 is four months. And so that's how they do their planning. And uh, I won't go into details, it's a bit confusing, but each increment is defined by a Soyuz undocking. And so when we plan for those um, six months of time, what we're planning for is all of the flight resource requirements that are, that are in that increment. And in specif specifically in planning for the, um, the research that the crew will be doing, we're focusing on the crew members that launch in that increment time frame. So for 43-44, it's, um, the crew, uh, Scott Kelly and the rest of his crew la launching in um, late March, and then the, the crew's launching in uh, late May. And as a point of, uh, well, no, I'll get to this in a minute. And so, and actually it's a bit, um, I added the second page, because this is a, a little bit confusing because of the one-year mission. You see that we have the crew members up there for a year. Well, normally it looks, it looks like this, where each increment pair, it's a little, it's not terribly neat, but it's a little neater in terms of you have this crew up there for six months, another crew going up and staying for six months. Oops. There we go. Okay, here's another graphic that I took from the station program. They have a lot of good graphics out there. Um, that shows the, the timeline for uh, planning for each increment pair. Um, and this shows the, the strategic planning phase. So the um, planning for each of these increments for all the research is, um, is managed by the um, research planning working group out of OZ, and they kick off um, uh, this process at about L minus 18 months. Um, and uh, for the human research, um, we are looking to um, work towards um, having an informed consent briefing at about L minus 12 months. So um, what, the, what the human, what's, I'm sorry, missing my notes here. Um, so when, the, when RPWG kicks off the strategic planning phase, they're asking all of those potential sponsors um, of research on station to provide all of their inputs of everything they want to fly and bring forward to put on that increment. So everything they want to launch, um, all the activities they want to do, um, all of the samples they need to bring home, um, all of that has to get uh, put together and sorted through to come up with a, um, come up with a research plan. Now the unique thing, uh, the extremely unique thing about doing human research is that crew participation is completely voluntary. And this is something that um, is unique to all other station research. Um, other uh, payload tasks that the crew members do are essentially assigned to them, saying you will do this task. But for our research, for human research, it's completely voluntary. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a, a legal and ethical um, consideration. So one of the reasons why it takes so long, which and you'll hopefully appreciate this in um, a little bit as I go through this, is to prepare for this informed consent briefing that we target for at about a year before um, they fly. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so again, I already sort of discussed some of this. Um, um, RPWG 
collects those flight resource requirements at about, they kick it off at about L minus 18-ish and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, ask for inputs at about L minus 15 uh, from everybody. Um, and again, you have to provide all of this, um, all this information. And as a, as a point of reference, I'm gonna go back real quick to the FPIP chart. So we're actually in that strategic planning phase um, right now for increment 47, 48. So the crew members that will launch um, a year um, in about a year, a year from March or so, we are in the process of um, uh, planning, planning that increment and pre preparing for an informed consent briefing for them in about another month or two. So for HRP research, the ISSMP team um, coordinates and integrates all of the requirements for all potential research that we might do at that time and we submit it as, a, as, a, as one input to, to OZ. That's part of the service that we provide to, um, to HRP. So because of this, and uh, in the time frame, um, we have to have a, um, a well-defined study that's, act that's been selected for flight at the L minus 18, no later than L minus 18 months, in order for us to consider it in this process. Um, and that's sort of the ground rule that we tell folks is, is it's about 18 months from having an approved proposal um, through that select for flight process of how long it will take us to get, to get a study flown. Um, now some studies are more complicated. Some studies require um, you to build and launch new hardware or take a whole lot more time to integrate and work out um, issues. Those could take even longer, but as a, as a, a good rule of thumb, that we tell folks is about, is about 18 months. Okay, so um, in the midst of working all those providing the requirements to RPWG, our team sort of in parallel is working with the international partners as well as um, other potential, um, if there's other NASA users out there that want to use the crew as subjects to integrate all the human research into what we call um, complement scenarios. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in more detail to explain why um, the first week post-flight is so constraining, but um, just um, trust me for now <laughs> uh, when I tell you that the, um, uh, um, that because the first week post-flight is so constrained, this is what drives um, how much research a crew member can um, participate in because there's so much human research that's um, proposed and planned that even if, even if a crew member is willing to do anything at all, they're, I'm all about the science, sign me up for everything, they cannot do it all because it will not fit in that first week post-flight. Um, let's see, so as a result, we end up developing what we call complement scenarios um, uh, for all the, the various um, human research studies that are proposed, which represent potential combinations of experiments whose requirements can be implemented in that first week post-flight. Um, and so we develop these based on um, experiment requirements and constraints. And by the way, all of these um, uh, studies have to have been approved by the JSC IRB as well as a multilateral board called the HRMRB. Um, and we have to have individual studies as well as these complement scenarios approved by those boards before we can ask crew members to sign consent forms. Um, so because, because doing these complement scenarios requires detailed requirements from each study and because you have to put all these approvals in place, that's another reason why it takes so long. It takes quite a while to work out um, all of these scenarios and get all of these um, approvals. And so just as a, um, I mentioned we are working on increment 4748. Um, we just wrapped up um, working with our international partners on those complement scenarios, and we uh, developed nine potential complement scenarios, which I've shown here, and you, you can't read this, and you don't need to, but <laughs> it just gives you an appreciation for really how complicated this process is. For this particular increment pair, there, were thir there are 38 human research studies that, that are available for crew members to um, participate in. And these nine scenarios show um, which, which ones will fit and play well together. And so for each of these, each of these scenarios, we've developed a draft post-flight schedule that shows how it will fit within the constraints um, 
available. And we'll talk more about post-flight constraints in a little bit. So um, just to, um, to clarify with this, again, like for example, for 47, 48, we've developed these, we're going to the IRB with these complement scenarios and we're working towards a consent briefing in March. Um, if you just now have a study ready, it's too late to be considered for this initial consent briefing for that increment. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Since I can't read the words, I'm just yeah, saying, sorry. <laughs> it looks like the bottom of the bottom segment is all being identical. So is the bottom everything that was available and the top? Is yeah, no, I, I can explain that. So the bottom part here is th these show studies that uh, have minimal requirements in the po first week post flight. So for these, these studies are ones that can fit in any scenario. The ones up here are ones that have um, pretty large or, or uh, constraining requirements, and so they only fit into some scenarios. But these are the ones that, you know, it's just a blood tube or, or you know, a 10-minute questionnaire, and those can typically fit into any, any scenario. So, yeah, sorry, I don't mean to show a slide that nobody can read, but, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to talk some about the actual process for the informed consent briefings because this is confusing to, to many folks. So um, the crew members are given, um, they are briefed on every study that's, um, that they are targeted um, to potentially participate in. We develop a target participation matrix with the international partners and all that really means is that, you know, for some, um, some studies, particularly with the partners, they don't have as much flight resource available. So sometimes if there's a JAXA crew member, they're only, some studies, they, they're only targeting their crew member to participate in. But for the most part, crew members will get pitched all of the studies that are available. Um, they do not see the complement scenarios I just, I just showed you. They're not asked, they don't see those and they're not asked to choose one. We don't ask them to do that. They basically hear all the research, they fill out an interest survey and say, yeah, I'm willing to do that, or uh, that sounds, no, <laughs> not interested in that one. Um, and we take their, their interest surveys and then we um, match them against the complement scenarios to try to find the best fit scenario that maximizes how much science um, can be accomplished, as well as we take um, agency priorities into consideration as well. So once we've developed, uh, we propose a best fit complement um, uh, fit for the crew members. We present those to the international partners at a forum that we chair. Um, we get their buy-in and then we take that to OZ, the Research Integration Office for How approval. Present the choice of complements and let them pick one. Why do it the other way? Um, it's, it's, it's a little too, um, well, kind of hard to explain, but we really don't want to put them in that position. Um, it's really a lot easier to just say, what, what are you interested in? We'll figure out the best fit. Because the other thing with the compliments is, and I, I should have I clarified this, is it's not necessarily that they're going to do, like say they do scenario nine, it's not necessarily that they have to do every study in that scenario. Depending on their interest, that could be the best fit, but there's like three studies that they weren't interested in doing. So it's this represents the maximum amount that we can fit. And depending on their interests, we put them in the best fit, but they ultimately do only what they're interested in. So if they hear all the studies and then they had to figure out what they're interested in and then go back and try to pick one, that's, that's a little too much to, um, to ask them. So we basically do that work for them. Self-selection in either direction affect the randomization? I'm sorry? the self-selection for interest in studies or are not necessarily assignment to studies affect the randomization and, and the science? Do you find that people of one you know, educational background or one oh. whatever background are more likely to choose one? No. No, we've n we, haven't really, we haven't really seen that. We do have times with, um, with some studies that have such large footprints post-flight, we sometimes studies don't get done for a year because we, if a crew, if nobody's interested or only one crew member is interested in, but that study doesn't fit in with the best, the best fit science-wise, it, it doesn't get it doesn't get done. But we have a pretty good, good good mix, and for the most part, crew members are very willing to participate in most everything. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, so again, after we've developed the compliments and uh, we get approval from everyone, um, uh, once we get that, then we go to the crew members and ask for them to sign consent forms. And we typically will also, at this point, not just have them sign each, each form, but we'll prepare a summary for them that says, this, by the way, this is what you've agreed to do and this is what your schedule is going to look like and what it means in terms of what you've committed to um, testing-wise. So, and it, as it says here, the crew participation can be any subset of a complement scenario because um, they will represent a maximum number of studies that will fit together. Can I ask a question? About yeah. The timing, uh, on the informed consent briefing, you're targeting that at L minus 12, right? Yeah, roughly. Do you, hypothetically, do you think it would be easier if you could slide that a little bit to the right? Or is that already so locked in with everything else that it wouldn't buy you anything? Um, it wouldn't buy us too much because we can't start BDC and man in the loop training until we have their consent. Um, so that, that, that's part of it. You know, it, it goes back to, whoops, to um, here, another station slide where the tactical phase until we get their consent, we, we can't start doing the real work of scheduling BDC and whatnot. And we'll talk some about the limitations of pre-flight time, but that's actually one of the challenges we face is trying to fit in all the, the pre-flight the pre data collection. So in some ways that can um, um, relax things, but we still, um, yeah, we, if, if we wait too long, it, it, yeah, it just starts to drag out. Yeah, I, I didn't make a connection of the training, but that probably is a big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you targeting the same time frame for the informed consent briefing with them? Um, that was handled a little bit differently. It, it also depends on when the crew's in town. Um, and I actually can't remember um, exactly when we did his, his briefing. I don't know that they were done right at the, at the same time. The one-year mission, all the planning and stuff was all a little unique. <laughs> didn't, didn't follow this, this neat process. Sir? Question for briefing. How many increments do you already brief uh, one increment or two, three increments of crew members? Or only three, for example, now you say 12 months before means in the next uh, year, year from now, it's, you're talking about increment 47, okay? Mm -hmm. So you brief only to the increment 47 crew, or you could have 47, 48, 49, or more than members. You know? uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be briefing the 47, 48 crew in, in the spring. We have already briefed all crew members that will be launching before then. So we've already planned the complement scenarios for. The backup crews. Yes, yes. We also pitched to the backup crews. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the here's the graphic again, um, and this just shows that um, after, again, once we have their consent, we can start the um, uh, the tactical phase, and that's where all the the meat of the integration works with developing ops products, procedures, doing training, and baseline data collection, and and um, um, all of that. And it, and it just so happens that ar around, around when we do the consent briefing is about when um, OZ is baselining their um, research plan. So that allows us to get in our updates based on the um, crew participation, although that hasn't happened lately, <laughs> as you're well aware. Um, so anyway, that's sort of where the, um, the meat of things um, um, happens. So in case, um, if you're still kind of wondering why, why it takes so long, um, hopefully this can help understand. I know Yuri recognizes this. This is another station program graphic. This is something the uh, lead increment scientist uh, for each increment um, maintains. And this shows all of the research for the current increment, 4142, all of the research, all the payload, um, payloads that are proposed as part of this six month increment. And I hope you can appreciate that that's a lot. That is a lot of research. There's a lot of people that are wanting to do operations on the space station. Um, and this box up here shows the um, human research. Uh, the blue is NASA, no. Oh, yes it is. Blue is NASA sponsored. Uh, red is um, ESA. Um, um, green is CSA. So you can see there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of human research, but there's a whole lot of other research going on too. And you know we we work to integrate this and sort of help the station program out in terms of um, integrating that 
the human research, but the station program has to try to figure out how to implement all of this and meet everyone's requirements. Um, so that's another reason it takes, it takes so long. That's a, that's a lot of stuff to try to plan for and get ready and make sure there's enough up mass and down mass and crew time uh, to get it accomplished. Okay, so in summary, um, there's a lot of stuff going on on station, which is a good thing. Um, and it, careful planning is really crucial uh, to ensure the success of all the planned operations on station. Um, I hope you can appreciate that there are specific unique challenges and constraints of doing human research that require um, additional integration in planning. You know, some of the other non-human stuff, they might not need to have their requirements quite so well defined as we do in order to put those complements together and brief the crew members a year before they fly. Uh, now I will say that the initial consent briefing is not your, the last chance to get on an increment. We can consider new research um, as part of a delta briefing that we typically do at about six months before they fly. But that's only going to work if that study is such a low profile that it will fit within what they've already signed up to do. So if it's something that's a big, you know, has a big research uh, post-flight hit, like you want to do another MRI, it's, it's not going to fit. You're going to have to wait till the next, uh, the next cycle. Okay. So again, if you're still wondering why it takes so long, um, I'm not going to talk this, don't worry, but <laughs> this is just to give you an appreciation for the fact that, it, that it's complicated. This is a graph that we put together for our team that just shows the, um, the functions and support that we provide that get from e having each individual study to an integrated complement, uh, providing all the products that are necessary um, to the station program in order to actually conduct the experiment on station and provide data to the PI. So it, it takes a while. So again, back to the chart I showed uh, sooner. Um, for those of you that, that sponsor research, I uh, just want to emph emphasize that again, we're, there's not a whole lot of time left with, um, with station. What we normally tell folks in terms of research planning um, is to assume about four subjects a year. If you're not a, a huge study with a big footprint, um, that's a good number to assume if we have access to six, six crew members a year, assuming no Russian participation. So assuming you have four subjects a year, you have about an N of 12, which is kind of typical, um, and then you factor in the 18 months of planning. If you want to get your research completed by 2020, we would need an approved proposal in a year in order to do that, assuming it would fit. Um, and again, we can't take all of the research late in the flow and expect to get it all done. That's, that's not going to work. <laughs> so um, this is just an, an, an appeal to get, uh, if you're an HRP researcher, to get us your um, science as soon as possible so that we can uh, integrate it into the, into the flow. And, and also remind folks that, you know, the approved proposal, that means that before then, it's actually been written and been merit reviewed and all of that, that takes time as well. Okay, that was the part about why it takes so long. I don't know if there's any questions on that or if something isn't clear. So when yep. do you start funding the research? Um, well, we don't fund them. The, the research elements fund them, but um, that's usually at the time of selection is when they get, is when they're funded. So, um, for example, if an uh, investigator submits a proposal to a solicitation and they get, they get peer reviewed, they will get funded at that point. And that's when we would start working on our feasibility assessment um, and they do their IRB review and all of that. But even if a crew member doesn't want to do the experiment, even if you cannot find a crew member who's willing to participate in that particular experiment, you're still funded? Um, we usually don't have that problem. Um, for any flight investigation, um, HRP will um, uh, award it for a definition phase. So if it turns out that um, we get a study in and after working on it, we're not sure it's really possible to implement. It doesn't have to get selected for flight. That's part of one of those, one of those gates. If we're, if, you know, we never had a study where we've said, I don't think any crew member would ever sign up to do this. <laughs> if we ever made that recommendation, then HRP would have to consider whether or not they want to proceed with selecting it for flight. But there's always an out with flight research that investigators know that it's not a guarantee that you get funded that you will fly. So, but we, we've, ne we ha we've had some 
some studies that took a while to get crew participation, but that's typically not an issue. And crew members are, are very willing to do the, doing, do the science. So this question is about the ISS, and the, uh, the rule, not rule, the role. Do you also get involved in the so-called preparation of these safety data packages? Yes. To go to the PSRP? Yes. The launch? Yes. Launch? Okay. Yes. And yes, our team, yes, we have safety engineers on our team and we take care of that and all the toxicology <laughs> um, provisions and all of that, yes. The payload integration managers come into picture, they are part, they are part of the ISSB. For example, each payload has got a, a payload integration manager. Yes, we actually provide a station program has payload integration managers, but for human research, ISSMP acts as the PIM for all HRP sponsored research. So. And I should have mentioned before we what our sort of model is. We assign um, a team to uh, um, work with each individual investigator. So we have like a um, you know basic project management. Um, you know, a, a, a project lead as well as support scientists for each investigation, and then we also have a, a team a management team assigned for each increment pair that oversees all the inputs of all the requirements and the operations and those and those type of things. And then we have people like safety engineers and whatnot that make sure all the, all the hoops and hurdles that are required get, get accomplished. So yes, that's a function that we provide. We're essentially the PIM. Okay, so um, next um, I was just gonna talk some about uh, unique challenges in designing um, flight experiments. Um, so in general, and obviously what's the first thing that comes to mind? with flight research. Obvious weightlessness, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and again, our team, ISSMP, is here to um, assist investigators in figuring this out for, for human research. But, you know, weightlessness is the obvious one um, that can be as simple as just making sure when you've designed your experiment, you have a place to put everything that, so it won't float away or also dealing with um, like fluids handling. Um, for us, we primarily deal with this um, in terms of bodily fluids, of which we collect pretty much all of them now from uh, crew members. But obviously any, any system that you wanna fly that has any kind of fluid in it, you have to consider um, how it might behave in uh, microgravity. There's obviously safety considerations, um, uh, toxicology, um, containment, uh, proper containment of materials, flammability, um, off-gassing, um, shatterable materials, all these things you have to um, consider. Um, there's also engineering design considerations. Um, I won't go into a lot of this in detail. I think we could have some of our engineering experts within the directorate give a whole nother talk on <laughs> pros and cons and tips on uh, designing flight hardware, but um, uh, there's obviously other engineering design considerations to, to consider. Um, for example, if you wanna fly a device that doesn't like to get hot and um, typically is you know cooled sitting on your desk and there's no convection up there, so you might need to consider if you have to have forced air cooling going across your boards, um, things like that. I used to always use as an example for this, um, the fact that if you have a device in your lab that you're used to plugging in the wall, well, there's no, there's no AC outlet on station, but that's not true anymore. <laughs> station program actually has um, inverters now that let us fly devices with um, AC power. So I wasn't gonna go into a lot of detail here on this, but there's obviously a lot of things to consider with um, designing <laughs> flight experiments. Um, for us, the big thing now are resource constraints. Um, I'll talk more about crew time um, uh, specifically, but there's us also limitations with up and down mass. Uh, I think folks heard about the loss of Orbital 3. We're now a little bit crunched on up mass because um, we lost that uh, vehicle capability for a while. Uh, power and data can be limiting and other constraints come, um, come to mind. And these limitations and constraints evolve as the mission architecture changes. And one way we like to describe this is um, to sort of consider, it, consider um, the operations envelope for your um, experiment, or in our cases, sometimes it's the whole increment, is sort of a box. And the box isn't really rigid, but going into an increment or start of your experiment, we kind of have an idea of how you might fit within that box. But then as the mission evolves and changes, as you, know, you, lose, a, um, you lose a vehicle and now you don't have much um, 
you're going to have difficulty resupplying your consumables or getting the hardware you needed up there. Or they have to do an EVA, uh, emergency EVA, so now crew time is limited. All these different flight constraints sort of push in on this operations envelope. And it's our job for HRP researchers um, as ISSMP to help manage this and work with the PI to try to uh, make sure we can get all of the science accomplished. Okay, so I wanted to talk some more about um, crew time in particular and first start with um, pre-flight pre -flight time, which we sort of touched on earlier. Um, this one you don't hear about too much. It's not the most limiting resource, but it is becoming um, more constrained um, as we go. The crew training flow is very full and uh, leaves limited openings to do baseline data collection. Um, so remember this is an international space station, so the crew is not here all the time. They have to do training uh, both in the U.S. and Russia and Europe um, and in Japan. Um, so the time that they're here, they have to do all of their systems training for U.S. systems as well as all the uh, training for NASA payloads. You saw all those studies that are on um, all the research that's planned on station. All those studies need some type, well maybe not all of them, but um, most of them need some type of training with the crew. And so we're all, again, competing for their time before they launch. Um, and, and all of our activities are done when they're here at, at JSC. Um, so this somewhat constrains the ability to train for science and perform testing. Yes? I have a question about that. <clears throat> Why has to be done at JSC? Maybe I'm missing something, but you know, blood draw is a blood draw. You know, mass, your weight is your weight, et cetera. Et cetera. You're, you're talking about that kind of baseline. Yes. Like, well, the, the system. Someone's taking their weight. Um, that's a good, sorry, something popped up here. Um, that's a good question. We, we typically do all of that here because we like all those measurements to be consistent and uh, done in the same manner, and most PIs want to, want to do those measurements themselves. For some of the international partners, like JAXA, they will do their BDC when the crew members at JAXA. And usually on those rotation, rotations as well, um, you know, they plan to go to those locations to do a set amount of training on systems as well as payload. So it's designed for them to do um, what's needed on those partner activities at those locations and not our stuff. Does that sort of answer it? But you're right, there is, there's nothing to say that we couldn't do other BDC and other locations, but it's, it's typically all done here. Okay, so post-flight BDC, I've mentioned before how constrained this, are, it, this resource is, so I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I think folks know that all crew rotations are now are done on Soyuz until we get a commercial um, crew vehicle online. Um, I don't, don't know if everyone's aware, but we do bring the crew directly back to JSC after they land. And they typically get to JSC about 24 hours um, after they've landed in, in Kazakhstan. Um, and we refer to, um, this graph shows the um, first week post-flight. This is days after crew landing. Um, the zero is um, what we call R plus zero, return plus zero. Uh, we consider that the time from when they land to when they go to sleep when they get to JSC, which is more than 24 hours, so it's really more than a day, but that's, that's what we consider um, R plus zero to be. And as you can imagine, they're pretty tired by the time they get here. <laughs> They've had a rough journey from uh, coming from space and uh, traveling across the globe to get back to, back to JSC. So we limit uh, how much testing we do um, on that day to uh, as passive tests as, um, as possible. Um, so the graph shows, uh, uh, should hopefully give you an indication of how um, limited this resource is. We have a crew duty day of, of six hours. Um, two hours is allocated for rehab time. There's uh, quite a bit of, as you might expect, medical testing that's required. Um, the crew does get some time off, which I think they deserve. Um, and then the time that's left is available for science, and it comes out to about 11 and a half hours total for that first week post-flight. And this graph is just a, a representation of the amount of time available. It's not set in stone that you, know, there, you cannot do testing on R plus three or how much time is available on each day. We develop a unique schedule for each crew member. Um, some days we might run over and then the next day we don't do as much. 
Um, and we always look for efficiencies between studies as well as um, data sharing with the medical testing wherever possible. So, and just again, an example of why this is so constraining. This is an example schedule from uh, a landing with uh, two USOS crew members. And you can see that that's pretty darn full of uh, tests with lots of constraints and notes that the crew has to follow based on, you know, dietary restrictions or what clothes to show up in for a certain test or what have you. So it's a very busy, very complicated time. So you might ask, why are these constraints so limiting? Some folks have said, why don't we just request more time? You know, six hours isn't much in a day. But, um, you know, the priority in this period is to rehabilitate the crew member to um, get them back to a, a, a safe terrestrial function. Um, you know, the crews might look good in any minute if you see them around site, but um, in general, they're, they're probably pretty fatigued and could be prone uh, and vulnerable to injury. Um, they may have significant circadian disruption, which can really mess with your scientific results. Um, if we try to do too much with them on any given day or in that week, um, it can really overwhelm the available time and uh, the crew member resources. And uh, too much testing and uh, overwhelming them, again, that can bias your results. Um, you know, if you do too much, you start to compromise their, your data return um, if you're overloading the crew. Okay, so in-flight crew time. Um, if uh, those of you that, <laughs> that have, have uh, worked with um, on station know that in-flight crew time is a pretty limited resource as well. Um, I will say that um, the station program has really done an excellent job of uh, emphasizing the need to maximize utilization on station now that we're at assembly complete. Uh, they have a goal for 35 hours a week. They frequently um, exceed that. Um, and we are often the beneficiaries of that, but it, it really is, um, I mean, we really do see as uh, users of the station that, that the program is, is very much for that this is, a, it is about the science and is about the utilization. So we greatly appreciate that. Um, so this is good news for investigators, but again, it is a limited resource. There is only so much time in the day. Um, the program and HRP are working more closely with the Russians to be able to utilize their crew time. But at any given time, there's only three crew members whose time you have um, available to do all of that science that's on the station. And so I often get asked um, by folks, how much time is too much? Or they'll say, I need this much time for my study. Is that, can I get that done? Is that too much time? And my answer is always going to be, it depends. Um, because it's not about the total amount of time, although if you need like 300 hours, that's too much. <laughs> but um, it's not really the number, it's really, it really depends on your constraints and your requirements. So for example, say you need like 30 to 40 hours for um, uh, a, one crew member to do your study for six months. If those 30 to 40 hours have very flexible windows of when you, can, when you can do it, it doesn't require much time for an existing session, you don't need real-time data downlink or other things, that's probably, we can probably do that. If your study has really constrained operations, like I must do this on, on flight day 21, and I have to do it in this week, and I have to have four hours of KU downlink, and I have to have another crew member there at the same time, uh, we can probably, the program has uh, worked with us to implement a lot of complicated studies, but that will be much harder to implement and to be successful. So what we try to emphasize with researchers is to build as much flexibility and decrease the complexity as much as possible um, into your study. Um, but it is important, we also try to emphasize to investigators, you know, we will push, push them to try to give on requirements and flexibility as much as possible, but it's also important to clearly define when we cannot compromise. Because the last thing we want is to get your science scheduled and then have the data not be good because we, we went too far in, uh, in being flexible. Um, so another uh, important aspect of um, planning your crew time is to know how long each activity takes. Um, the amount of time you'll get scheduled for an activity, that's all you're going to get. In some cases, um, crew members will finish early. Um, in some cases, they really need to read the procedure. Um, each, crew member, each crew member is different. Um, and we just like to tell 
investigators that you need to remember that uh, chance there's a good chance the crew member might not remember their training. They may have been trained six months before they flew, and so they may need extra time to, you know, have to go find everything. Um, you know, follow the procedure carefully. It is not like doing the, doing the study in your lab. Something that takes you 10 minutes in your lab because you know where everything is and you're the expert and you do it every day, it could take them up to 30 minutes um, just because of the constraints of being on station um, and everything else going on. Mm -hmm. Example, the crew is scheduled to do something today, okay, like breast samples, can do something. So you normally monitor from the ground on the particular day you schedule, help him out when the questions come up? Yes. It, it depends on each activity, um, it, especially obviously for, for studies where we need to um, uh, bring power up to our racks or something, we have to go support and sit console. Or if they're doing complicated operations, yes, we will go in and sit and be available. But for days, like say they're scheduled to do urine collection all day, but, but nothing else, we don't go sit waiting for them to call down because they can usually figure out that <laughs> on their own. So it, it depends. So you mentioned something about the procedure. Because they get trained many, many months before they, they launch. So when the procedures and questions coming up, and they are taking more time. So you don't monitor to make sure everything went on correctly or not. So yes, for things that are complicated, we, we, will, we will usually always be there. Yeah, and, and if for some, by some uh, chance we're not there, you know, uh, the, um, uh, at Marshall Space Flight Center, they, they manage all the payload operations and so they know how to reach us. If something comes up and we not happen to be on console, they can call one of our folks and get an answer relatively quickly. So, but for the most part, we do, we support all the operations as they're happening. Okay, so that sort of brings me to the end, I guess in conclusion, um, I hope you got an appreciation for why Flying human life sciences um, in space is challenging. Uh, again, if you're sponsored by HRP, um, you get to work with us and we'll help you get your science flown. Um, I hope you appreciate that it really does require um, adequate time to, to plan and integrate with all of the other research, particularly the other human research that's being done on station. And uh, for investigators, it does require you to be flexible um, and sensitive to the unique constraints of space flight and be you also need to have a whole lot of patience. <laughs> so that is the end. Are there any other questions? Or mm -hmm. Assuming that uh, ISS availability ends around 2020, can you give us an idea of uh, roughly how late is too late to even think about submitting an experiment uh, to ISS? Well, it really dep it, you know, it depends on how many how many subjects you need. Um, you know, again, I explained that, that if, you have an, if you have an N of 12 and you plan for a year, then yeah, I need a proposed, an approved proposal in about a year in order to get that, in order to get that completed. Um, but again, it depends on what el whatever else is, is coming along. But if, it's, if you don't need very many subjects, it could, and it's very simple, it could take shorter. has swung now entirely the other way <laughs> and I, I get, please correct me, I, now I get the impression that the ISSMP now really decides, it seems like there's a huge number of experiments that are funded and ready to go and, and thoughtful and needed and important and not, there's no astronaut volunteer constraints I'm waiting for you to decide who gets to go and who doesn't and suddenly that makes you very, very <laughs> well, I like to think we're important anyway, but well, no. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of yeah. No, we we don't decide. Um, part of our feasibility assessment is we we tell HRP and the element um, when we think the study will be ready. Um, and when we think we can start proposing it to, um, to crew members. But again, we, we don't determine what flies when. Um, the only case where that could, that could come up, and actually that's, we're getting ready to face that with one study that has come to us that is very complicated, is where we say, this is so complicated that we don't recommend we even start attempting to do it until this other study is finished. And we've really never been in that situation before. We typically, we get the research in, we evaluate it, and then once it's ready, we start um, pitching it to crew members and, and, 
and flying it. Again, some studies have a higher throughput than others, um, but it all kinds of kind of works itself out. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Does all of this apply to wearable technology as well? Like, for example, if I wanted to fly a CO2 sensor or something like that. Yes. Yes. That 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 would apply as well. Although. Um, it, that's one of those areas where you probably would need IRB approval, but it's it's not that big of a deal. But you would need uh, likely need crew consent to wear something that's um, that's monitoring that. We've we've had cases of that where we had crew crew worn um, a research kind of radiation detector um, where they've needed they've needed consent. It's also true with questionnaires. Um, if uh, you know, you're going to ask any type of question that might come across as how did this make you feel as opposed to, you know, what button did you push or things like that. The IRB needs to weigh in on um, approving that and then we have to ask them to, to consent to do it. Is, is the radiation sensor, isn't that pretty standard? Don't they wear the of it yes, for um, the, the ones they wear as part of medical operations, that's something for, for anything crew health related, they, um, they just have to they do it if there's no consent required, but if it's a research study, um, they have to consent. Any other examples of wearable technology that has been flown recently? Um, we've flown a, um, well, and we're going to on the one year um, crew member, we have an activity monitor that measures, um, it's got a light meter in it. It's like a, it looks like a wristwatch without a watch, but it uh, has a light meter and measures activity and uh, motion and they use that to determine sleep patterns. So we're, um, we did a sleep study that wrapped up um, several years ago and now we're, but we're gonna repeat that study on the one year crew. Does it monitor pulse and things like that? No, it's just activity and light. You talked about two boards, one of the IRB, I don't know, MSRB thing. HRMRB. HRMRB. How often do you meet the second one? One more time, when, does it, when do you really meet the second one? When do you? When does the board meet? The HRMRB uh, meets quarterly. To discuss so, only multilateral. Yes, we bring all the, the um, yeah, each individual proposal has to go to them as well as um, the, the compliments have to get approved by them as well. But we usually get approval to get consent um, from crew members if the HRMRB hasn't met. But they say board quite members that participate in that or that they have totally different number of, totally different set of people. It's, uh, it's uh, representatives from all the agencies. Oh. Yeah. How is their review different than the regular IRB? Hmm. <laughs> it, it's really not, except that it's, it's all the different, you know, there's a rep from JSC. Actually, I'm not quite sure who makes up the board, but they rotate the leadership. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a JAXA, CSA, ESA, Russians. Um, it's just part of the process that they've imposed. And I didn't mention, but you also have to, um, there's an ESA medical board as well as a JAXA IRB. Um, if you're going to propose a study to be done by either a JAXA crew member or ESA crew member, you have to go to those boards as well. I can't quite explain the logic of all the different boards, except that that's the way the system is set up right now. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate it and learned a lot today. And I wanted to let the group know that on the 2nd of, uh, no, the 3rd of February, we have our next lecture series, which is Exercise Countermeasures. That's Linda Lurch, Lori Flout, Schneider, and Mark Gilliam here at 10 a.m. So we'd like for you all to participate again with us. And please make sure you fill out the evaluation sheets and turn those in. And Andy Self, if you'll see, see me just before you leave, uh, I've got a question for you. Other than that, I'm here. He's not here. Thank you. <laughs> He's not here. Thank you.